Hello. Wait, where's my? Ah, we're good. <laughs> Hello. Welcome, everyone. Where is my? Am I sitting correctly? Yes. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever this might find you. How is everyone doing? Ooh, 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 I see a lot of emojis on the chat. <laughs> Hello, uh, Chandra. How are you doing, sir? Pedro, good to see you. Richard, a lot of, wow, that's a lot of emojis. <laughs> How is everyone doing? I'm doing really well, as you can see from my mug. Mm -hmm. I am properly caffeinated and I'm ready to, to code some cool stuff today. So, um, just um hey nicolas how are you doing so mm -mm -mm, where do we start where do we start today we are going to start with we're going to start with the basics so hi <laughs> my name is jose luis i run this thing called parametric camp and um and we do live streams so we go live and we record tutorials on computational design, Grasshopper, Rhino, Unity, a lot of different things. And um, and while we are here and we're doing these tutorials, I have some live feedback from people in the audience, from the chat. So it's a, I'm really happy to do this. So, so if you want to learn more about what we do, just check out the channel. We have a lot of videos. We are right now in the middle of creating a new playlist called Advanced Development in Grasshopper. So we're going to be working on that today. We're going to record a few more videos. And if you want to learn more about what we do, check the channel and maybe check our social media if you want to know when we go live. Or you can just follow us on Instagram. I post a lot when we go live on Instagram. And you can also join the conversation that we have offline every week uh, in our Discord server, which the link is also, the links for everything are here on the description of this video. Now, what else do I want to say? Oh yeah, and if you like what we do, maybe subscribe to the channel <laughs> and maybe hit notifications so that you get an email or you get a pop-up in your phone when we go live. That's also a good thing or when we publish videos. Mehrad, hello, welcome. I'm going to talk a little bit about Seal right now, so you may want to stick around. Gintars, I'm not sure if we've met before, but welcome to the channel. And Mohamed, how are you doing? Yes, I have a chroma right here. I'm touching it right now. <laughs> Whoa, that is a cool emoji, Pedro. What is that? It's like a cat. It's like a Schrodinger cat. <laughs> All right. Okay, so before we start, I would like to bring your attention to a contribution that I just heard of from one of our parametric campers. Uh, his name is Mehrad, and I believe he made this work with Atuza. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing your names correctly. I apologize. Uh, but it's a new <laughs> Rhino plugin that is called Seal. And I believe the spirit between the, behind the project is that they want to use Rhino as an interface to create video games, basically, it's like all classic games. I believe so far they have implemented pretty cool. I just downloaded it this morning and I was trying it. So I'm going gonna, gonna to type seal dots and boxes, and then I can choose the color for myself. So that's going to be um, light orange and then the seal color. The computer player is going to be red. And I'm going to choose to play, for example, with a quad mesh. All right, so I'm, we're going to start. I'm going to make this a quad mesh and then I'm going to start. So look this and then that's a computer and I'm going to do this and this and I'm going to do this. And I guess the AI part of this is pretty good because the computer never messes up. Uh, so I don't know what you guys are using for this, but it's pretty. Yeah, I guess you're doing some kind of rule where it's looking if whatever they include is going to be used. Yeah. And then I made a mistake. And then, yeah, this is what happens when you go in life. You can't really. Oh, well, and then here, here, here. Ah, I got it. 
which probably means there's no open spots anymore. So yeah, wait, 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 am I gonna win? Whoa, that was a big strike. And then here, and then bam, bam, bam. And then, uh, this is gonna be for the computer. What? My turn? Oh, I don't know what I did. But I win! <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> thank you, thank you. I like that. I think the idea is extremely neat, super fun. And let me show you something that I got me really, really excited. So you can play on quad meshes. I believe there's a typo here with a quad. You can play on tri meshes, which is also kind of exciting. But, and this is the coolest part, you can also play with on custom meshes. So if you have a mesh, for example, I'm going to show my head that I've been working with in the previous streams. If you have a head and you want to play with the mesh as the playground, you see I just chose it and then I, I believe it's me starting. So I start here, the computer, seal goes here. I play here, seal goes here. You can use a custom mesh as a playground, which I think was an extremely, extremely neat idea. Big thumbs up. This is a very, very cool project. <laughs> very good Mesad and um, Meza, Mer Mehrad and Atuza. And I hear you're saying that Professor Magdillar Esmail was also involved. So big thumbs for all of you. <laughs> and um, I don't know, maybe consider including two players via web sockets that would be super cool too if you could do web sockets i don't know that would be super super interesting so yeah that could be super interesting actually so you can type in here a web socket address and then it connects and then you can play you know that would be really really neat good job i really like this project <laughs> all right and what are we doing today we are continuing the work that we've been doing with the advanced development in Grasshopper. So um, in that sense, we last time we met, we recorded a couple videos where what we did was I taught you how to load external assemblies, so DLLs, C sharp code from a third party that you could use in your um, that you could use in your Grasshopper plugins, correct, in your c -sharp scripting. So that was one thing. And then we recorded a hands-on exercise that was doing mesh manipulations with this geometry called Geometry 3 Sharp that Ryan Schmidt from Gradient Space has made available and is super powerful for meshes. I thought it was a really cool exercise. So what we are going to do today is we're going to continue uh, with the advanced development. And I think what we're going to do is I would like to teach you how to use Visual Studio as a development environment for Grasshopper. Uh, so that's going to be one thing. We're going to talk a little bit about the Grasshopper SDK, right? And we're going to talk about the difference between Grasshopper files and Grasshopper X files. That could also be interesting. Now I'm thinking whether if that's the order that we want to do thing. Uh, pa, 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 pa. Or maybe we don't need that. Maybe that can be moved here, really. I'm looking at my notes. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder why that's there. Hmm. Oh yeah, I wanted to do that because of, uh, well, let me show you what I'm doing here. So I wanted to do that. So this was what I wanted to do today using Grasshopper to develop. I'm gonna, we're gonna be taking a look at the script parasite. Um, then the Grasshopper is the case. So I wanna take a, I wanna show you, I wanna walk you through the Grasshopper SDK documentation and do a few examples. And then... I think the idea was that I needed to use this so that I could 
teach you grasshopper unique IDs. <sighs> um, and then use that for to doing a few examples. I think that was my thinking process. Do I want to do that? Mm. Yes, global unique identifiers, which is something that is quite important when you want to target uh, individual grasshopper components. Mm. So, so let me think about this. So it feels, so for these examples, are we going to need this? Maybe I can just use this and then I will, ex I'll just put it here and then I will just do it real quick and then I will explain it better in the previous video. I think this is a much better approach. Yeah, I think it makes more sense as an order. Okay, so we're going to do that. Okay, oh, a lot of comments, sorry. Uh, Andres, good morning, Rarasto. Good morning, Dibak. How's everyone doing? Kartik. Oh, so many familiar faces today. Very nice. Random uh, grasshopper component. Oh, Gintars, you've been following the. Okay, thank you. We I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, ghosted mode. Uh, web sockets. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So let's get busy because I need to jump on a few meetings after this. So I'm not sure I have a lot of time. So let's start. Let's get started. So the first thing is we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about um, using script parasite as, so um, for that, I'm going to need to put <clears throat> for Rhino and then Hey, Hex, how are you doing, man? Good to see you. Uh, <clears throat> script Parasite. Mm -hmm. And for that, what am I going to do? Uh, for that, I'm going to also want to show a teaser which is going to be how to write files to a custom folder. Okay, and for that, I need to find a, I need to find an example of that. And an example of that is going to be here. Uh, yes, exactly. And it's going to be here and uh, going to be, I'm going to copy and paste this. Sorry, I'm just doing something on my other window. I'm just finding some code that I want to recycle. Okay. Mm -hmm -hmm. Okay, so that's good. Where was Grasshopper? Oh, it was right here. Sorry. Oops. Okay. Okay, and I think for this I can do, we can do um, full C sharp script component. So what do I want to say? <clears throat> We're going to show, the problem is going to be that sometimes the interface is a little wonky, right? And we don't get good um, autocomplete sometimes. So, so what we want is to use a full development environment. And for that, what we can do is we can use a Visual Studio using the script parasite. That's the story that I want to tell. So in order to do that, I will want to start with an example of, I don't know, uh, for example, adding things to a list. Adding things to a list is something that doesn't give me an autocomplete. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
Așa, pe exemplu. Um, And then it changes to light. Okay, and then okay, and then so I will want to do an example where I'm typing this, and so for example, list list double new list of double okay new light, and then. Is less. Ah, yes. Uh, okay, so I'm going to write a slider here. And then another slider here. This is going to be start. And this is going to be and this is going to be ooh, an integer and this is going to be another integer okay and then and then <clears throat> i'm going to save this as for example, you think yes, four point eight, you think yes. All right. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm going to start by explaining the problem and then dropping a script parasite and um, showing how that works. Okay. Um, I think I got it. Are we ready for this? Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right, am I center on the screen? Yes, I'm kind of centered. A little bit. Okay, let me move this perhaps a little bit this way. Am I center now? Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's do this. <clears throat> Hi, and uh, <laughs> I didn't even know what I was gonna say. Uh, what was it? Okay, starting over again. Starting over. Uh, am I recording? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Jose Luis and welcome to another video in, say that, say that, uh, starting over again. Hi, my name is Jose Luis at, uh, starting over again. What is it that I typically say? What is it that I always say? Hi, uh, and welcome to an. Hi, this is Jose Luis at Parametric Camp, and welcome to another video. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, all right. <clears throat> all right, starting over again. Hi, this is Jose Luis at Parametric Camp, and welcome to another video in this series. Advanced Development in Grasshopper. Um, in this video, what I would like to talk about is about the development environment that we get when we are working with C-sharp script components within Grasshopper. 
And if you have been following my previous videos or if you have tried to write some code in this component itself, you may have noticed that the development environment itself, so the window that we're given, has some um, features that are typical for professional development environment. It has autocomplete, it has highlights, it has tool tips, but uh, it's not really a full fresh professional development environment. It's missing like uh, many features and sometimes it's a little wonky. It's just, it's understandable because it's just a script editor. It's not really a full development environment, but sometimes you might feel that the experience of writing code inside of this environment is a little frustrating. So for example, um, let's say I wanted to create a component that outputs a list of numbers from a starting value to an end value. For example, the way this would be is I would probably start by creating a list of integers, for example, that I'm going to call nums. And I'm going to define that this is a new list of integers. And you can see that, it, that the, the recommendation was really weird. And then as soon as I enter parentheses, the autocomplete kind of healed that. So I now need to go and be met, met, I need to go and write it again. So that was a little wonky. And then if I want to create a for loop that starts at the value start, i is less or equal than end and i plus plus, you may have noticed if I do nums dot, if I do dot, I'm not getting autocomplete, for example, for lists. This is um, one of the main issues that I have found consistently in the C sharp IDE, the development environment within Grasshopper. So I just need to know that I can use add um, and list equals nums, all right? And this would work, I believe. But you can see that the autocomplete, the development, it wasn't great. It wasn't as powerful as in other development environments. So what I would like to teach you in this video is how to use Visual Studio as a development environment for C Sharp script components in Grasshopper. And this is actually quite easy to do because there is a plugin that is called a script parasite that allows us to do that, that allows us to work with Visual Studio as a development environment. If you go to uh, Food for Rhino, which is the main repository where we can download plugins for um, Grasshopper and for Rhino, you will see that there's this one called Script Parasite, which if you download and you install it, then you will end up having uh, somewhere here, I believe you will have, you will end up having a new component here uh, that is called the script parasite, right? The way this works is very easy. So what I can do is I can drop this component here and then I can turn in, I can plug in a few inputs. So for example, whether if this, uh, if the parasite is enabled or not. So I'm going to toggle here a Boolean toggle, right? And then F is going to be the folder where the script parasite is going to copy the scripts. So basically what script parasite does is it takes a look at a C sharp script component, and then it takes the code inside of that component and it writes it somewhere on your system into a project that can be read by Visual Studio so that you can open that project with Visual Studio and work with that project inside of Visual Studio. And then what um, the script parasite does also is that it constantly monitors for changes in the files that you have done with Visual Studio and it updates the Grasshopper definition with those changes. So what are we going to do? So for example, I have created in my system a folder on my desktop that is called dev for development. And I'm going to copy this route here and then I'm just going to paste it here. This is where the folder that I want all my scripts to be dumped into. And I want this to be enabled, okay? But it gives me an error because it says that this component should be added to a group with exactly one C Sharp script. The way this works is that C Sharp, the, the script parasite knows which C Sharp script to look and to write into a file if I group it in, if I group it with that C sharp script component. So now because both are on the same group, script parasite knows that this is the script that I want to dump into 
this folder here, which I'm going to dock here, and then I'm going to dock here. And then you can see that as soon as I turn this on, these two files showed up on my development folder. All right. And because this is a C sharp project, I can double click this and my Visual Studio will pop up and it will already display a Visual Studio project with the one file that is a copy of the code that I had inside of the C sharp script component. So I'm going to dock this here. All right. All right. So I'm going to crank this up and um, you can see that what I have here is essentially, am I on the way? No. What I have here is essentially, uh, what I have here is essentially the same code that I had here. It's just that I had the using, I had the utility functions, I had all these members. That is the exact same thing. And you can see that the only difference is that um, I got like some namespace because this para the script parasite needs to give it a, a namespace. But if I unfold script, you can see that this is the code that I wrote for. So what's nice about this is that in because I'm working in Visual Studio, I now have really nice and almost flawless autocomplete helpers, whatever. So if I were to say list integer nums is going to be equal to a new list of integer elements. You see, I didn't get any wonky problems. And if I save this file, you can see that this got updated automatically and now it's not outputting anything. But I can do for int i equals start um, i is less or equal than and and i plus plus. Then can you please go to nums and dot and you can see that now I have the autocomplete for everything that is available on, on a list, right? So now I can say, I just want to add this and then I get the autocomplete of the items that I want to add. I want to add the value of I, okay? And if I now save this, you can see how it got updated here, um, but I didn't write the output. So I need to say list is equal to this value called numbers. And as I save, then this should update, but that is also true. Something that happens is that not always does this component perfectly update synchronously with this. So what I would like to do is I would like to make sure list equals nums and I'm going to save this and now it just got updated. Okay. And um, I'm going to, and sometimes the formatting between is, so that's also not perfect because, because this development environment uses a different, um, uses a different um, tabs or spaces than this one does. When we save from one to the other, there's typically sometimes a little bit of uh, dissonance in the spacing. So pros and cons. It's also not perfect, the communication, but eh, it's fine. Okay. So what's nice about this is that all of a sudden now you can enter the world of more professional development environments and you can harness the power of Visual Studio for developing things that actually live inside of a C-sharp component, which is kind of nice. And also because you're in Visual Studio, you have and we are loading all these dependencies, Rhino, Rhino Geometry, Grasshopper, etc. I also have access to everything that is Rhino common specific. So if I type bref dot, you can see that now I can choose everything that is inside of Rhino Common Library and I get autocomplete, so Boolean difference. And you can see that I get now compute the first solid difference and I get more autocomplete than I get. I get more helper text than I get inside of C Sharp script component. So I can scroll through this. They don't go away. It's a bit more stable. It's a bit nicer to work with. Okay. Beautiful. Now, and so this is, I highly recommend this when I do a bit more of, of high level or like big components that have a lot of stuff going on. I always use these techniques, it just makes things a bit easier and faster. Okay. Now, the caveat with this is that if you hard code here a, if you hard code here a, um, a route for the files, you can see that these files, the files for the Grasshopper, for the Visual Studio project, are now living somewhere else from where my grasshopper file is. So something that I typically do is that 
uh, I make sure that the files that I'm using for development are living in the same folder as the file, the Grasshopper file that I'm working on. I can either do that manually, so I can just write here the route of the Grasshopper file, but it turns out that there's a nicer way of doing that because if I were to copy and paste this file somewhere else, because the route here is hard-coded, then uh, I would lose that connection, the connection between the files living in the same folder as the Grasshopper script. So something that I typically do is I write a component, a C-sharp script component that I typically call here, all right? And what this component does is a component that it finds what is the path of the folder where the current Grasshopper file is. The way I do that is by doing this. And I'm, so the algorithm, the algorithm is, I'm going to take, create a string that I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to call it current folder and I'm going to initialize it to nothing, all right? And then what I'm going to do is, um, and I'm going to explain in more detail what I'm doing here in the next videos, all right? So I'm going to go a little fast over this. I'm going to define a, an instance of the grasshopper document that I'm going to call grasshopper doc, and that's going to be owner.omping document, all right? Is this going to work? It is going to work because owner is an object that is defined in C sharp in, in Grasshopper script components, which means who is owning the current document. All right. And if Grasshopper document dot, oh, that was a really bad if, if Grasshopper document dot is file path defined, which means if the Grasshopper file was saved and there is a path for it defined somewhere, then what I can do is I can say, well, current folder, current folder is going to be grasshopper, grasshopper doc dot file path. All right. And then actually, no. So I'm going to call this string path is going to be that. And then current folder, what I need to do here is I need to use the system path to get the directory name, and I believe I may have to add here some, um, I'm going to try to get the directory name, and that's going to be from the path that I just loaded. Is this going to work? It's not going to work because um, path is given, uh, oh, oh, because I'm using, I'm using the same name as the output. So P and P, so that's one problem, okay? And the other one is that path doesn't exist because I probably need to import here system.io. Is that correct? Yes. This is the library that contains all the objects that are good for interfacing with your file system. And it turns out that path is an object that has a lot of functionality, but it leaves to, it has a lot of functionality to interface with the system. So write files, read files, etc., etc. It's just that it needs to be loaded because it's not part of the defaults. All right. What that means is that in this case, I was able to get the current folder. So path is going to be equal to current folder. And if that is true and I run this, I should be able to get a path of the kind. Yes, parametric camp files, advanced development and using VS, which is where this file is living right now. And if I plug this in, you will notice that this is still here. All right. But if I go to that path now, which is going to be, oof, where is that? Um, which is going to be at parametric camp files, advanced development, using VS, you can see that the files just showed up here, the two development files. All right. Now, I'm going to add an, an else here because it might be the case that this the grasshopper file has just not been saved yet. And because it hasn't been saved, then its path defined will be false. And therefore, what I would like to do is I would like to give an error message that is called no local folder was found. Please save your file first. Or I could even use it with the warnings that we have seen before. So for example, I could say this dot uh, component dot 
add runtime message and I want a runtime runtime message level dot error and I could do this error here and I can't really see so I'm just going to add a new line here all right okay so that's just for the sake of completeness okay beautiful now what did I do here and why what is this grasshopper document object how did I know about owner and omping and blah 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 all those things are things that relate more to how grasshopper works and how the components are architected and I will explain that farther down in other videos in this playlist okay so until then i highly recommend you use script parasite um i think it's very nice it makes working with writing serious and long code inside of c sharp script components it makes it easier faster and more fluid and i also recommend this hack which is always using this component that finds what is the current folder in which the grasshopper is the grasshopper file is saved so that your files for the, your script files are next to your grasshopper files it's something that i like doing maybe you don't maybe you like to have them separate i don't know it's perfectly fine okay beautiful with that i think i'm going i think this is everything that i wanted to explain in the next video, I will explain where all those ideas, where all those objects, the grasshopper document, where they come from and how can you learn more about those. We're going to take a look at the grasshopper SDK, the software development kit. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching this video. If you found it useful, maybe like it, maybe leave a comment, maybe subscribe to the channel or maybe not. Maybe just keep watching whatever, whatever you fancy. Thank you very much and see you in the next video. Bye. All righty. So, okay. Any way to get autocomplete in Visual Studio code when using Parasite? I've only been using Visual Studio, plain Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code. I barely, Victor, I barely use Visual Studio Code for C Sharp. Um, I've tried, but it just, I don't know. It just didn't work as nicely. I think Visual Studio for C Sharp is still, um, I, I still like it better. I don't know. Okay, so that was Script Parasite and this and this Grasshopper Scripts. I'm going to save this. I now need to save this. It's in Visual Studio. We can clear this. And no, we're not going to save anything here using Visual Studio. All right. So, what is the next thing we're going to be doing? We're going to take a look at the Grasshopper SDK. And for that, we need to pull the Grasshopper SDK, which is somewhere here. Okay. Ah, uh, oh no. Oh, I missed, I messed it up. So what I was going to do, I was going to do one video script parasite and the other video was going to be, how do we write? Uh, and I was going to do that. In, um, I was going to do that in the other video. Uh, okay. So I'm going to have to rewrite this. Okay. So, okay, so here's the problem, <laughs> what I did wrong. The part where I was going to develop the here, the find the folder here, that was actually meant for the next video, the video where I explained the Grasshopper SDK. But because I did in the previous video, then I don't have an example for, um, I don't have an example for uh, 
the other video where I'm going to be talking about the Grasshopper SDK. So I think what I would like to do is, in order to fix that, what I would like to do now is I'm going to record a, a different ending for the previous video. And in the previous video, I will just cut when I, when I have just written the, the code. I'm just going to do it. It's just easier to, 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 to do it than to say it. So bear with me. Uh, as I, <laughs> okay, so I was here. Okay, so I was here. And then we had this and that was at in dev. That was in dev and then I was here. Okay, and I will find a way to cut at the right time. <clears throat> I'm going to move the grass already to get here. Okay. Now, one thing that I typically like, so when I work with both Grasshopper files and scripts that live inside of Grasshopper files, um, if a, a typical problem that I run into is that if I save these files somewhere else in a different folder than where my Grasshopper file lives, then things get a little confusing for me. So what I typically like doing is I like to make sure that the development files, so all these scripts and all that stuff, is living in the same folder as my Grasshopper file. One solution to that would be, well, just take that folder, copy that route, right? And then paste it here, and then paste the, the folder here, and then make sure that I use this and I plugged it here. So that is fine, but if I ever were to rename this folder, and I forget to update that in the Grasshopper file, or I just move the file somewhere else, then I will start getting into problems. So what I would like to do is I would like to make, I would like to find the path of where this Grasshopper file lives in a programmatic way using code so that whenever I open the Grasshopper file, the correct file path is always there. Now, in order to do that, and this is something, this is my preference, okay? That you may just like to have a dedicated folder where you have all your scripts and you're not messing with your Grasshopper files. That's absolutely fine. Um, but it's I like putting them in the same place so that things are compartmentalized. But at the same time, what I would like to do is I would like to write an example where I teach you how to do that. Because in order to do that, you're going to have to write code that is aware about the Grasshopper environment. So it's aware about which file is running Grasshopper, this Grasshopper definition, and where that file is located. And in order to find those things, you're going to, you're not going to be able to use Rhino Common because Rhino Common is just, um, it's just for geometry and for managing the actual execution of Rhino itself. But instead, we're going to have to use this other thing called the Grasshopper SDK, the Software Development Kit, which is basically very similar to Rhino Common, but it's just specific to Grasshopper. Okay, so in order to do that, um, we're going to treat that. We're going to see how to do that in the next video, where we're going to speak. We're going to talk specifically about the Grasshopper SDK. So with that, I think this is what I wanted to do for this video. Again. Very recommendable if you're working with complex Grasshopper, c -sharp scripts, and with a lot of code, whatever, then I find this idea of working on the side with Visual Studio much more fluid, much faster. It's a bit nicer than just using the default, uh, the default IDE, okay? So I encourage you to give uh, Script Parasite a try. It's, it's actually quite nice.
So let's go on to the next video where I'm going to talk about Grasshopper SDK. Thank you very much. And if you like this video, you find it useful, maybe hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, say hi, etc. etc. See you in the next video. Bye bye. Okay, and I'm gonna write here my notes. Coding. I components. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to minimize this. I'm going to minimize this. I'm going to keep this here. And I'm going to delete this. I'm going to save document as <clears throat> okay. I'm going to paste it again here. <clears throat> you know, it should be four point nine. Okay. All righty. <clears throat> so what are we going to do now? We're going to talk about the Grasshopper SDK. And in order to do that, I'm going to find Grasshopper document. Um, uh, uh, what is this? The Grasshopper API. Grasshopper document. Context changed. Grasshopper document. Grasshopper kernel. Grasshopper component. That's interesting. Grasshopper document that's also interesting what else are we going to take a look at Ooh, data path grasshopper path rule change structure um that's also interesting the structure class is also interesting what else are we going to do what is owner? Where does owner live? Hmm. Where did I get owner from? That's a good one. Is owner uh, members component? Write a document, I guess I have a component on ping document. Grasshopper on ping. I'm doing a little bit of research here for the video on ping document. Raise the ping document event on the top level object and try to find the document which owns this object. And it returns a grasshopper document. So then, where did owner come from? Let me just um, and here I'm gonna remove this. I'm gonna paste this. Okay, path doesn't exist, so. Using system.io and if I use this is very meta. If I use a script parasite to figure this out true, then I should have another folder here. I should have another folder here with the other file. 
not, not, not this one, this one. Run script owner. And it doesn't exist in the current context. Interesting. Huh. So it doesn't exist. So where did I, how did I figure this out? Where is owner defined? Script instance. Is it part of script instance? Script instance. There's nothing on script instance. That's very weird because there should be something because it's a class that it's inherited. Oh, I have to say, I haven't used the Grasshopper SDK a lot, <laughs> as you can see. So um, I am really not sure where that is coming from right now. Let's do some Googling. Grasshopper document owner. Document grasshopper document class is serializable owner. Guess it says the owner of this document. A document grasshopper kernel. I grasshopper document owner. The owner. Is it the same if I do uppercase? That shouldn't, it doesn't work. It only works as in lowercase, which is very odd because that's not a typical, hmm. So where does owner come from? I have no idea. Owner document. Huh, interesting. Well, I don't know. And it looks like that's going to take some time to unpack. So we may just want to not do it right now. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back to let's go back to business. So we were here. And uh, da, 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 da. okay. Four point nine grasshopper SDK. <clears throat> All right, let's do this. Hello, my name is Jose Luis at Rubber Blast, starting over, starting over. Hello, <laughs> starting over. <laughs> that was bad. Hi, this is Jose Luis at Parametric Camp. And welcome to another video in this series, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. In this video, I would like to go and explain really, really superficially what the Grasshopper Software Development Kit is and why it's interesting for us when we're doing development in Grasshopper. You may have heard me in previous videos talk about the Rhino Common and being this library that lives inside of Rhino and that we can use to access all the power of geometry manipulations, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes things about how Rhino, the actual program, the actual software, how it runs on your system, right? So it turns out that not all functionality that we can access in Grasshopper comes from Rhino Common. Some of the functionality is specifically the one that relates to how Grasshopper works, how the solutions are updated, how the components are laid on the system, how they talk to each other, etc. All of that, Rhino, Rhino Common has no idea of how it works because it's a plugin, 
right? So all of that functionality actually lives somewhere else and it's provided to us through what's called the Grasshopper SDK, which basically is another library, another DLL, another file with a lot of code packed inside of it, just like Rhino comma is, but that takes care specifically to, of giving us interfaces, giving us classes and giving us functionality that relates specifically to Grasshopper and how Grasshopper works, okay? So, and before we get into looking at documentation or anything, I would like to illustrate this with a very simple example. If you were looking at my, if you saw my previous video, in my previous video in this series, what we did was we tried to, we created this very simple C sharp component that just spits out a list of numbers from a start to an endpoint. And we were using script parasite to dump to some development folder to dump here some files that um, that then we could use to open them in to open them in um, to open them in Visual Studio so that we could do development from this C sharp component in Visual Studio and then have access to better autocomplete pop ups etc cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem was that something that I like a lot is to have my development files so the files that that script parasite generates all of this grasshopper studio project to have them next to the grasshopper file that I am developing. And in order to do that, because I have to feed the script parasite component, I have to feed it a path. If I hard code that path, if I just write where the file is, then that might be prone to errors and it might be prone to me moving the file around in my file system, whatever, and things not working anymore or the file has been saved in the previous folder, in the one that is hard-coded here. So what I would like to do is I would like to write a C-sharp script component that always, always gives me the path where the current Grasshopper file is saved. So that if I move that file somewhere else, that path, when I open Grasshopper, will be updated programmatically. In order to do that, I need to write code that is aware of the Grasshopper environment. So for example, uh, this code is living inside of a file that is saved in a particular folder, okay? And that functionality cannot be provided to me by Rhino Common because Rhino Common has no idea of Grasshopper or anything called Grasshopper being attached to it. That all functionality comes separate and it comes from the Rhino Common, gra uh, blah, 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 the Grasshopper SDK, okay? So, in order to do that, I will need to know a little bit of how Grasshopper works and look through the documentation. But what I would like to do is I would like to write that example and show you some of that class, some of those classes that we're going to be using, and then go back to the documentation and take a closer look at those. So for example, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to write a component that I hope is going to generate programmatically this output. So the full path of the file where this was the grasshopper definition is saved right now. So what I have here is so right now I have this here hard coded, but I would like to write a C sharp component that does that automatically because this grasshopper, this component, this script doesn't really need any input. Um, I'm just going to remove all the inputs and I'm going to rename this here. All right, that's going to be and then the output is also going to be called here. And what I would like is for this output to be um, to be the this folder, this, this path, all right? The way I'm going to do that is by writing the following. First of all, I'm going to define a string variable that I'm going to call the current folder, all right? Which I'm going to initialize to nothing, okay? Then, well, and then what I'm going to do here is, first of all, I'm going to declare a variable of the type grasshopper document. And that's going to be with an underscore in the middle. And then I'm going to call this dot. Where this is coming from and why is this, I will explain it in a second. Then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to call the owner object. And the owner object is an object that is in the scope of my C-sharp script component that represents the grasshopper document. 
And I'm going to call this function on the document, on the object that is called on ping document. When I do that, this function will return an instance of a grasshopper document variable that I'm going to save here. And this, doc, this variable will have information about the file, the document that I'm currently running inside of Grasshopper. So therefore, from this object, doc dot, I will be able to do things that relate to the document. So for example, you can see that I can add objects, I can find what are the active objects, who is the author, what are the attributes, I can, um, I can con do where the, I can figure out the context, I can subscribe to events, I can, what is the display name, the ID of it, that's a lot of stuff that I can, that I can get from here. So one thing that I would like to get is the file path. So I'm going to type here file path, which you can see it's a string. So what I'm going to do is because it's a property, so I'm going to save this string path is going to be all of this. So file path. All right. And then just for the sake, I'm just going to output here to to for through the output. This is going to be equal to file path. If I do that, then you can see that what I'm getting out of the component is the full fledged file path. So all the folders, all the structure, etc., including the name of the actual file. And if I were to save this file somewhere else, so for example, I'm going to save this to my desktop. All right. And then if I were to now update this, because I saved to my desktop, uh, this didn't update because Grasshopper doesn't update when I save files. So what I can do is I can recompute my solution and you can see that the file now is on my desktop. Okay. So this is a very nice because if I were to open this file somewhere else, then this will update programmatically. So I'm going to save the file back where it was, or I'm just going to close it and load the file from where I had it before. Okay. So that's the file that I just downloaded. I loaded from the actual folder. The problem is that I want only the folder. I don't, I just want the path. I don't really want the file as part of the path. So what I could do is I could just do some string manipulation and make sure that I split this whole thing by the backslashes. I remove the last part and then I put everything together again, but that's not very clean. And what something that I can do is that I can use the system path object to um, to take a file path and just retrieve some information from that file path. So what I can do is I can call, I can bring in here using system.io and IO is the namespace in C sharp that contains all the functionality that is useful to interface with your file system, reading files, saving files, figuring out what is the character that separates um, folder names, et cetera, et cetera, which is not the same in every system, right? And what I could do here is I can say path only is going to be equal to path, and which is an object that comes from system.io that gives me access to functionality for the system dot. And then you can see that I have a lot of things, get full path, file extension, combine, et cetera, et cetera. It's an object that specifically is designed to work with paths and to modify them, improve them, uh, find data from paths, etc. So what I can do is from here, I can get the directory name of a particular full path. So that's going to be file path. And if I now output file path only, all right, you can see that I just regenerated this, but this has not updated. So I'm going to recompute here and you can see that um, this is not working. Let me recompute again. And we can see that this is not working for some reason. <laughs> so let me take a look at why it's not working. Uh, oh, why did it not save? Okay, so path dot using system, oops, 
using system.io, using path.get directory name of file path and path only here. And here we just do path only. And we're going to save this. Okay. Okay, uh, that was just an error of, because for some reason this code had not properly saved inside of C Sharp script. So I just had to open it up, write the same thing again, and now it works. Sorry for that. I don't know what happened. So you can see that now I have just the file path, all right, not the full, not the full thing. And if I if I go now to the folder where my grasshopper file lives, this one here. You can see that as soon as I plug in this new folder here, all these script parasite files are going to show up here. And then if I were to now, for example, I'm going to remove all of this. And I, if I were to save the file to a different folder, for example, let's say I've saved the file in my development folder, the one that I had here. All right. You can see that I have it here. I'm going to close up. I'm going to close the file. And then as soon as I open the file again, let me open the development folder. As soon as I open the file again, the exact same one, you can see that this picked up the folder in which it was, it plugged it in here, and then all the script parasite files showed up, all right? Which now makes the whole thing much tighter, much more programmatic. It satisfies, satisfies my OCD. I'm really happy about this, <laughs> okay? Now, the question is, where, what the hell is this grasshopper document thing? Uh, this, uh, what is this property file path? Where is this coming from? Where? So let's take a look at the grasshopper SDK. All of those things we can learn from the documentation. This is very similar to the Rhino common documentation. What you can see is that the grasshopper API or the SDK, they're basically the same thing. What it does is that it has a bunch of, uh, uh, files that are like tutorials, development, examples, things that you can do with the Grasshopper SDK. And then it has the namespaces. Basically, the Grasshopper SDK has two main namespaces, Grasshopper IO, which is for reading and writing files, and the actual Grasshopper file, Grasshopper kernel. And you can see that actually, when we're living in Grasshopper, you can see that every Grasshopper component already implements the grasshopper, grasshopper kernel, grasshopper data, and grasshopper types, all these namespaces, grasshopper, grasshopper kernel, grasshopper data, and grasshopper types. And where, why is this important? Because that gives the component access to grasshopper functionality. So for example, if I go to grasshopper kernel, you can see that there's a lot of stuff, the grasshopper active object, the alias, the author, and there's this thing called the grasshopper component. The grasshopper component, it's a representation of the component that the code that we're writing lives in. So for example, and when, so for example, this has access to an icon, a description, it has access to attributes, the category that this is living. So we can know if we write code, which, which category that component lives in, for example, we can have access to that. We can have access to the instance global unique identifier. I will talk about why that's important very soon in some examples. And then I have a bunch of, I have a bunch of functions. So for example, we're already familiar with the add runtime message. If you remember when the previous videos, when we were doing um, uh, error check-ins, et cetera, et cetera, we use this function a lot to display messages on the component. And you can see that the documentation tells us that it needs the level and it needs a, 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 a text, an error. And the mess and the level is also part of the grasshopper kernel. So you can go to grasshopper kernel dot enumerators and you can find runtime message level. Okay. So for example, when I am in a component and I write here this dot component this dot component is actually a reference to the grasshopper document, to the com grasshopper component that I'm in. And that's why I have access to add runtime message and then grasshopper 
runtime message level dot, for example, um, remarked uh, testing the Grasshopper SDK. Okay. And if I run this code now, I will get a bubble here testing the Grasshopper SDK. Okay. So, <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's great. And, but where is this component coming from? Well, if you expand the Grasshopper script instance and you look at the members, you can see that the component itself has this thing called the IGH component, component as a variable. So what basically that means is that the Grasshopper script component contains this object called component that we can use to access the component and the properties of the component itself, or to add behavior to the component itself. So for example, by using this variable that lives in the Grasshopper script component, we can add runtime messages and get bubbles, etc., etc. Wait, so what about Grasshopper document? What is this GH document? Well, the exact same thing. If we go to the Grasshopper kernel and we look at Grasshopper document, what we can see is that we get a sing that represents the instance of a single Grasshopper document. What that means is that that gives us access to that gives us access to the Grasshopper document itself. So, for example, if I can say Grasshopper document doc document is going to be equal to <clears throat> it's going to be equal to that one Grasshopper document the instance in this component. I can use this or I can just not use it. And then here from doc, for example. I will be able to get, for example, um, doc dot, uh, and I don't know why it's not auto completing. So let me just use this directly. This dot grasshopper component dot, for example, get active objects. All right. So for example, I can get the list of active objects, and then because it's a list, I can do count. So for example, can I print to the console how many active document how many active objects are in this whole document and if i do that then you can see that it tells me that there are 10 active objects here so that's going to be one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten i guess uh, for example right so um grasshopper document is basically a link to the grasshopper document that owns the component that we're writing our code in. And we can see now that there's a lot of stuff. We can find the author. We can see whether if we're rendering custom elements, uh, we can see how many objects are in the document. We can access the profiler and get document about that solution state, change things. We can move objects around. We can auto save. We can click, calculate the bounding box of some things. I don't even know what this is. There's a lot of stuff that I don't know here because I haven't really written a lot of code that um, modifies Grasshopper or takes, but I guess, um, so, so yeah, but this is quite interesting. And actually, if you want to, to do, th if you want to write components that mess up with um, the document and with other components and etc., this is definitely the place to start. Um, in order to learn about how to do meta manipulation of Grasshopper. Okay, beautiful. So with that, I would like to wrap it up here for this video. This was a quick introduction to the Grasshopper API or the Grasshopper software development kit, or in other words, the library that contains all the methods and all the classes that give us access to information about the document and the component that we are working with or access to manipulating that information. And actually, in the next video, the next in this series, the next hands-on video, what I would like to do is I would like to write a few components for our parametric camp library, uh, plugin, whatever. I would like to write a few components that give us information about the state of the execution, the state of the document, etc., etc. So we're going to do a few hands-on examples on the next video. 
Until then, if you liked what you saw or if you found it helpful, maybe like this video, subscribe to the channel, say hi, join Discord, uh, share on Instagram, or not, or just keep watching the videos. Absolutely fine too. Thank you very much and see you on the next video. Bye. All righty. Cool. So, uh, okay. So I'm going to save this grasshopper. <clears throat> Uh, so this is grasshopper. This is uh, inside of development. So I need to take care of this and I need to copy this into here, which is the, the one that I want to publish. Okay. And then what we're going to do, Oh, what are we going to do now? Grasshopper document class. I may want to leave this there i'm not going to use script parasite um i'm going to remove this okay so i'm not going to remove this and so what i would like to do now is i would like to write a few examples for components that take a look at the the state of Grasshopper and Rhino, okay? Now, I don't know. Mm. Did I do, did I try things out here? Vector, vector, test part. I wonder if I have examples of this or if Oh, I have some examples here. What is this? Oh, I think I did. Yeah, I think these were some examples. So what did I do here? Uh, I used reflect. Okay. Um. I used the uh, reflect. Oh, this is runtime warnings. Uh, not interesting. I did here grasshopper document. I did here. What what was this? Oh, this was just a heavy document. Review color selected. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, it changes the preview color. Oh, interesting. I see. <clears throat> Get thumbnail. Pass up a document thumbnail. And then it saves it somewhere. And this is the thumbnail. Oh, nice. <laughs> and then it gives me, this is a component that gives me which ones are heavier. calculation and I'm going to redo this again oh 
Okay. And this is compared to find that guy. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, and component or this component is okay. Uh hey no no. How are you doing, sir? Find component by ID component lock to string. Uh, if component is different than null, print component dot name, and it's not doing anything. Enable. Ah, oh, yeah. So this is what was happening. Okay. So okay. So for some context, so we're going to record a video now where we're going to make a few components. A component that gives us information about the Rhino document, a component that gives us information about the Grasshopper document, uh, a component that changes the preview colors programmatically. So you can see here. All right. Um, and so without bypassing this stuff here, and a component that gets the thumbnail of a particular of a particular Grasshopper document. And uh, yes, it gets the thumbnail and then a component that is able to figure out which ones are heavy components and and to keep them to figure to 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 get them by um, to get them by what is it called to get them by ID. And then I think what I stopped doing, this is a file that I was testing things out the other day when I was preparing for this video. And I think I left this undone. So, because I think what I was trying to do is to programmatically, uh, to programmatically disable components by ID. But it looks like I was not, I'm not able to find component by <laughs> they are getting advanced, yeah. They're getting um, by ID, but if print um, component equals equals null dot to string, uh, the component is null. So it looks like it. This component is not found in the Grasshopper document. So maybe what I need to do is I need to get an instance of the current document. Uh, maybe I need to get uh, owner dot on on pin document, right? And then I need to use doc here, and I got the same problem. Yeah, so maybe that's why I left it here because I just could not find um, the, the 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 document. So I have a little bit of time, so I think I'm going to give this a try here. So the problem is we're trying to find components by ID. Maybe this is what I'm doing wrong. Can I please convert from I grasshopper component to grasshopper component? Okay, so let's take a look. Find component. Find component method. Search component that contains the locus system. Search for component using ID filter. The component with the ID or null if no component could be found. And it returns an I, the interface for all Grasshopper component types. Don't implement this interface from scratch. Inherit from Grasshopper component instead. Okay. So maybe this is not working. Can I find the locus? System drawing point. 
component system point so maybe what about if i am able to find the locus of that component i'm going to try something else uh, So AO dot log no, no. point component grasshopper. How can I find where the component is? Category, component description, exposure has isolate objects locked, mutable, nickname, obsolete, face, processor time, read runtime, message level. Trigger autosave, right? So, no. Hmm. I wonder if there's a grasshopper find component not working. What if I component that can find grasshopper component? Are you gonna put that links with the current? Expand selection method. Expand selection method. What is this? No, I'm not sure this is what we need. All right. Anyone has any idea of what's going on? Nope. Um, okay. Uh, when the reference audio has an audio. The build file. Uh, mm, I'm not sure that's what I'm looking for. Receiver, receiver, find component, receiver name, kernel parameter, receiver generic object, volatile, find component using nickname, for each blah blah blah, if grasshopper log objects nickname contains nickname, return grasshopper, ew. That looks like it could work. But it just doesn't look nice. Just have a component, drawing point. I point to search for. Eh. Uh, hmm. And find mm, <clears throat> more results from Grasshopper. How to get find why access the attributes access to the attributes of an object. Slider gear. I said that I forgot what I'm going to do. I said this device then. Component on ping document. ID parameter, parameter instance. Source component, grasshopper, find component. Okay, so this is what I'm doing. And this is what I am not getting. 
the lesser component on ping document. So maybe that's the part that I'm not quite getting. So component on ping document. And dog component. Find component. If component is null, return. Am I missing something here? Nickname component global I active objects. Grasshopper active objects, component names. Okay, so let me save this because maybe this is not the right, maybe I'm getting the ID of the input or the ID of the output. Is that what's happening here? Okay, so let me copy this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to save these tests as a grasshopper X, which I believe I already did. <laughs> okay, so I'm oh, I'm going over my old steps of I'm literally going over the steps of things that <laughs> the process that I was probably following for debugging. So I have the grasshopper test. So I'm going to search for the Global ID, so defini chunk definition objects, okay? And what I'm getting is that this is the grass, the GUID, print reflect an error streams. And what I see here is that this component is basically a chunk. What is this chunk? Chunk index zero is all the parameters. Wait, 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 wait. What is going on? Container, true. Uh, edit position. Reflect script source. Object index three. It looks like I'm not getting the ID of Okay, so the ID that I was looking for wait the same ID is shared by Wait, oh, okay, so you see, I have the same ID. Ah, oh, all right, because the ID that I'm getting is the ID, the generic ID of the C sharp script component, but I'm not getting the instance IDs of each particular C sharp script component that I'm dropping. And that's the error. I'm not getting instance ID. I'm getting just exactly that was the problem the instance id and then this is blah 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 and it picks it up it's c sharp 
and then I can turn it off. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. All right. This is the one. Okay. And then that was the problem. Okay. You see, you always need to go go le low level. Like, look at like the zeros and ones to figure out what's going on. <laughs> I will explain what I did here. I basically looked at the source code of the grasshopper definition to figure out what was going on. Uh, <clears throat> in very interesting, actually, and very not a very smart mistake, but also not a very dumb one. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that was not a terrible mistake to do. <laughs> Okay, so now I need to, once I have the element, I can say whether if it's locked, and then I can say component uh, locked. Can I change this? Equals true. Is this, can I access this? Equals enable. Does not exist uh, enable. Oh. Object expired during a solution. Uh, I'm not sure that's the way to go. Oh, maybe it is. <laughs> um, it that's that, that that didn't look great. Nope. <clears throat> Do I have any side? Uh, and then but I think that only affects probably so if I recompute this is doing nothing oh oh and now it's just off Huh. Probably because this is also not working. Yeah, I don't think this way of locking or enabling component dot enable add it to the document. I wonder if we can create something clear data. Select components, compute, create other different description, displays fire. Context change, expire solution, expire preview. All right, let's take a look at the documentation again. So we're going to figure out where uh, if the component is locked. Act. Get so sex the lock, the lock components are ignored during solutions. So maybe what I should do is I would say component log equals enable, enable, and then doc, oops, enable here, and then doc dot expire solution. Is that gonna work? Uh, Object expired during a solution. No, that's not the right way to do it. Mm. How did I do this in my other component? I I have um. I have. Okay. Uh, how did I do this? with the this one dynamic data tools how did i do this mm -hmm. data gates for example number gate because the grasshopper gate component okay grasshopper gate component and this is what has the logic Pumping document. Uh, 
This is document, the expire solution, expire solution, and then maybe we can say expire solution true. No overload for expire solution. Okay, let's take a look at expire solution. Expire solution. Uh, expire the solution. This will blank all objects. And it doesn't take any. It doesn't take any. So why does it take then? Why did it take here? Expire solution because this this one is not for the document. Solve instance probably is, it probably leaves as part of Grasshopper data component. Expire solution and then expire solution. Maybe it's a scheduler solution. Call back. Hmm. Maybe we just need um schedule schedule a solution delay. Maybe we need to schedule the solution. And there's no callback. We just need to schedule a solution for. This is very. Oh. <laughs> All right. True, false, and then we get the error. Uh, yes. So I don't know now off the top of my head how to do this. Really, it's going to need a bit more of research. Hmm. Because it looks like it really messes up with the component. Um, hmm. I wonder then what other thing we could use here to modify the component so that we can, you know, uh, do an example of something that. So let's say that instead of this, we do component dot and add it attributes category bake geometry clear data collect data component id compute data attributes description display expired document draw view for expired solution expired preview So maybe we want to expire the solution. And then expire solution equals true. This is going to be up. This is just terrible. All right, so false. Nope. And then true turns on. It just works even worse. <laughs> yeah, this does not. This is not looking great. Mm. Expire solution for the document. But what about expire solution for a component? For a document object. Well, this function already do something which expires the current solution. It will make sure all caches are erased, all that's expired, and the event is raised. Um, I'll call to an other this function. In the request, make sure you have to clear local data caches and expire downstream objects. Hmm. Maybe this is a little too much. And I feel I'm not making a lot of progress, and I want to record this video before we leave today for lunch. So um, I'm going to see if we can just do something else on the component. Otherwise, we may just not. 
expired solution, exposure, is vacant, isolate object, what is that? What is this thing? Is preview capable, keywords locked, message, moved between documents. Uh, what does this do? Okay, so oh, I guess this message here. Ah, <laughs> okay. Well, we could also just not have anything. Mm, well, this could be something, but it's also not very exciting. I want to really see if we can change some behavior in this thing. Mutable nickname, name, object change, obsolete. What is obsolete? Is it flagging something so that it get, get, all right, not a lot of, okay. Uh, component dot. Mm -hmm. Absolute on display on ping document and solution expired mm -hmm. parameters phase ping document processor time. Ah, we could maybe print component that processor time dot to string and see where that gets us it gives us that it took 130 seven which is what we got here basically Processor time in milliseconds. We're already getting it from here, so we would like. That's also okay, but I would like to use this to make some changes, like turn it off or something. I really want to turn it off. Where is Andrew Human when you need him? Huh? <laughs> he will know how to do this. Run account, remove from the messages, expire, self category, trigger, auto save. I'm right. Okay. Do I have meta hopper? Okay. So how about this? Should we take a look at the source code of meta hopper? And all right. So maybe that's the solution. I'm really stubborn when I want to do something. I'm not sure if you realized already. Meta hopper. And this is the beauty of open source code. Do I have meta hopper? No. I don't. Okay. Meta hopper. Okay. So meta hopper is going to go into my desktop because I don't know where my grasshopper components, developer set, folders, components. I don't know what that is. And I'm just going to add here meta hopper. I'm going to add it from the files that I downloaded and then I'm going to restart everything and I'm going to take a look at this because there is source code here right oh wait no there's no it's not open source ah no so I can't really take a look at that download it from here Andrew why did you not do the, make this open source? Boo. <laughs> okay, I'm reconnected. It looks like we are back. All right. Are we back? <laughs> okay, that was a big internet internet flop on my side. Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry, I went dark, but like the internet just disconnected in my apartment. I'm sorry, I'm back, but I'm back. 
stream is still going on. Woohoo! All right. So where was I? Yeah, this is going to be more complicated than I want for the for the. It's going to be way more complicated. No, so I don't want that. Uh, uh, uh. Nope, 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 nope. Mm. So I guess I'm just going to do the message part. Yep, and that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to become an add message kind of um, component. <clears throat> okay. All right. Yes. Connection issues. Yes, it was bad. Sorry, but. Nevertheless, that's fine because I was doing boring research to figure out this out and it was not very exciting. So, but I think I'm ready to go now. So I'm just going to dock this here and I'm going to put this here and I think we are ready to start with the actual recording of the video. So <clears throat> let's give that a try. And we're going to create a new folder. Okay, let me prepare the files, mesh components, and then this is going to be what? Um, what is this video going to be? Document components. All right. So that's going to be e.a document. And we're going to copy and paste uh, the last one one ends so i'm going to open some right up here <clears throat> i'm going to save this Uh, all right, then we're going to do this. Yes, we're going to open this. Okay, and this one. Uh, oh, no. Okay, so yes, I'm going to copy this here so that this make we so that we know that this works, and I'm just going to open this again. And okay, ah, and we're going to deactivate the preview. Um, okay, ah, oh, setting the preview might be hmm. Might be a good. Okay, so I'm going to now copy this and say document components. And then I probably want to 
create one first, which is going to be Rhino. And what do I want to know about the Rhino document? Uh, so things that I want to know about the Rhino document, the Rhino file name and the Rhino path, for example. So, <clears throat> so for example, file, file name. And path, for example. And I'm going to write this here. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to take from file name, going to be equal to rhino, oh, rhino document dot file name. Oh, or is this is okay? And then path is going to be equal to rhino document dot path. And there you go. <clears throat> and actually, for this one, I would like to do for this one we're going to rhino common what is rhino doc rhino doc okay <clears throat> okay rhino rhino doc the Rhino doc class. Mm -hmm. Animation properties, bitmaps, fonts, locked. And then we have file okay, path. <clears throat> okay. I think we're good to start. So we have the Grasshopper API. We have the Rhino common API. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's start. <clears throat> I'm just gonna put why don't I'm how about I put everything on my desktop first? Um um, before I do that, because otherwise it's going to be quite messy. Um, development, uh, can I delete all of this now? Yes. <clears throat> I'm going to open this file and I'm going to open this other file here. Okay, let's get to this. <clears throat> Let's get started. So the first component we're going to write is a simple component that takes a look at the Rhino document that this Grasshopper file is currently attached to. And then it takes a look at uh, properties of that Rhino document. So for example, interesting things could be the file name and the path, for example. How can I access those? How can I access from the Grasshopper component how can I access the document or an object that represents that document? Well, if you remember, if we expand this area here called members, we can see that the grasshopper script component has a member that is called the Rhino document and is of the type Rhino doc. Turns out that this is going to be an exception to the grasshopper SDK because the Rhino doc is not managed by the grasshopper SDK, is managed by Rhino common. So if we go to the Rhino common documentation and I type here, what about Rhino doc? Do you have something for me? You can see that there is a Rhino doc class 
So I can click here and I can just go back to the main class and learn that there is this thing called the, the Rhino Talk class that represents an active model. And we can see a lot of things. We have a lot of properties. So we have the bitmaps for the textures. We have fonts. We have whether it's available or not. It's read only. We can access the lights, the materials in the documents. We can actually get a lot of stuff from the document into, into our components. So we can also access the path. This will be super interesting for us. The runtime data and or the views. And then we can also change things. We can we can create a new Rhino doc, we can dispose it, we can load from a file, we can get hash code, open documents, save documents. There's a lot of things that we can do, which is kind of interesting. Okay. So if we were to look closely, closely, closely to the documentation, we would get to know that, for example, for the output file name, if we access the Rhino document object that we have available for us here, dot, we can access all of that, all of those properties. So I'm going to go to, um, um, I forget, I'm going to use name. And I believe name is the name of the currently Rhino document that is loaded, the 3D file. So if I do that and I execute, you can see that I get the name of the file. So that's one thing. And I may also want to get um, which is the path of that file. So for path, I'm going to do rhino, rhino document dot file or path I may want to do. Okay, so path. All right, cool. However, something that I don't like is that if I'm saying path, I may just want, I may just want just the root folders, the folders that take to this file, but not the actual file itself. So that can do two things. One thing would be perhaps it would be much more correct to call this the file path. So if I do that, then um, file path should be this whole thing. That's one thing. But if I also wanted to just have the path to the folder, which is something that we've seen in the past that is quite useful. So something that I could do is I could add here a new calculation that is I'm going to use the system.io namespace, which is the namespace in C sharp that takes care of that gives us functionality for accessing the file system. And then what I'm going to do here is that the path, I'm going to calculate it by using the path object that lives in system.io. And then from a full file path, I'm going to use the get directory name function that given a full file path, it just gives me the path part of that full fledged uh, file path. So basically just the folders without the name of the file. All right. So I can just use file path, pass it there. And then for that is like, um, oh yeah, because this is an object. So yes. So because this is an object that I'm saving the path to, I cannot use this as an input for this file, this method, which expects a string. So easy peasy. So I'm going to basically just create a variable that I'm going to call P and that's going to be the path. I'm going to spit out that variable right away. And then I'm going to use that variable to for the path. Okay. And then if I plug this in here, you can see that now I have the file name, the full file path and just the path. All right. Which is kind of interesting. All right. I could also uh, create other things such as, for example, how many elements are in are right now active in the document? Is that something that we can compute? Let me see. So if I look at objects, um, I can probably say I have no idea. For example, objects. So let me see if that works. I've never done this before. So object is going to be equal to, for example, Rhino document dot up objects and that gives me a table and maybe there's something like count or something like that and if I do that this is going to give me the value of one because I actually have a file that contains this mesh so if I were to delete the mesh and recompute this I still get one object okay I don't know so what about if I copy this etc do I recompute and I have five objects now yep so 
maybe I didn't recompute correctly, or maybe it just keeps an instance of the object just hidden in memory or something. I'm not sure about that. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to recompute here. And you are, you can see how it, I, it's still doing five. Interesting. I don't know why that's the case. So why do I still have five? That's something to explore farther, I think. But I'm, I wonder if I just close this and I open it again, I still have five elements. That is n not, no template. And I'm going to recompute and you can see that there's no elements and I'm going to load the previous file. I'm going to recompute and I only have one element. So it looks like there's something about those elements remaining in memory or in the table that that's kind of strange. Anyway, so that was properties for the Rhino document. What about properties for the Grasshopper document, the file that we are currently working with? Okay, the way that's going to work is going to create Grasshopper document. And I'm going to do the same file name, file path, path, and then what other things can I get from here? Um, the amount of components, is that something that I want? Mm. Oh, a thumbnail. I may want a thumbnail here. Thumbnail. That is also going to be useful. And then the objects. How many objects can we do that? Uh, I think that's just as simple as uh, doing like an active object count, correct? Um, so this dot component dot get active, active elements. Mm -mm -mm. No, not the component, the document. Sorry. This grasshopper document get active. Active objects dot count. That's going to be objects. Okay. And then it gives me two hundred and eighty one. Wow, that's a lot. So what if I delete this? Does this recompute? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. <clears throat> All right. So I have gone ahead and I have created this empty C sharp script component that doesn't take any input. It doesn't need it, but it's going to output something very similar, the file name, the path, how many objects are present in this document. And for this one, we're also going to retrieve the thumbnail. Take a look at how this works. So for example, if we expand the members, we can see that we had an instance, we had an object for the Rhino document, but we also have a reference to the Grasshopper document that owns the component that we're writing code in. So what that means is that we can get access to a lot of stuff from that component. So for example, for file name, I can say grasshopper component and whether if you do this or not is, is entirely up to you, it's not mandatory. Um, but for example, here I can say, what is the file path? All right, and the file path is going to give us the full path of this object. 
So perhaps what I want to do is I want to load it first and take just take load it first here as a string and then use the system. So for example, uh, what am I doing here? Okay, so I'm going to say using system.io. If I say file name is going to be p, what you're going to see is that what we get is the full fledged, the full fledged file path, which is not what we want. So what we want is so that we will want that for file path, for example. So for file path, we actually do want that p value. All right. But for file name, we're going to have to figure out how to retrieve just the name of the file from this whole thing. At that point for that, we can probably also use our the path object, the one that we have loaded with system IO. And I'm assuming there's got to be something like get file name from a full path, right? So if I get file name from a full, full path, I'm assuming, yes, I'm, all, I'm going to be getting only the file name then and then for path, I can just use as we have done before, get get path, uh, get directory name. And that's going to be P. If I do that, I can export here just the path of the current file that we are in. All right. Now, something that I would like to do, though, is that sometimes if we were to run this component, if we were to drop it in a file, in a Grasshopper file that uh, has never been saved to the file. So you know how you open a new file and you still don't save it because you're just tinkering around with it. If you were to do that, then we would get some errors. So something that is quite useful to do is to first check if this grasshopper document dot is file path defined. So is has this file been saved ever? And if that's the case, then, then we do all of this. We, ex we, we save this to the folder. So we oh, <laughs> oh my God, it's kind of late already. I'm sorry, I'm a little messy. Uh, if that was true, then we generate all these outputs for the component. If it wasn't, then we just don't output anything. All right, more stuff. What about objects? I may want to uh, output a count of how many objects are there in the document right now. So I can do that by saying this grasshopper document dot uh, I, I active objects, but you can see that this is a method. So I need to call it and, get, and I get a list of objects. So I get a list of objects that then I can just take the amount of objects from. I can use count to figure out how many there are. And it looks like my file has 281 active documents, active objects, which is kind of true because I'm working on this prototype for a Grasshopper plugin, etc. And it has a lot of components already. So you can see that I have 281. Is this true? Let me delete these two and recompute the solution. You see how the count went down by two units? And if I undo that and I recompute the solution, then this should go up by two units. Remember, I'm recomputing the solution because Grasshopper is designed to only recompute if a component changes inputs and outputs. If I delete a component, not the, the rest of the components don't get updated. OK. And now the last thing is I can also get the thumbnail. So for example, where is if I do thumbnail, that's the output. What I can do is I can, from the Grasshopper document, I can retrieve the thumbnail uh, as an object. And you can see that the thumbnail is an object that is not part of Grasshopper or Rhino. It's part of system drawing bitmap. What that, what's interesting about that is that if I run this code, I get the system drawing bitmap so which is an object that represents the thumbnail, but I can't really see the thumbnail, right? So what could I do to see the thumbnail here in Grasshopper? 
well, I could write my own plugin or my own stuff that takes a bitmap and it turns into pixels and shows those pixels in the UI stuff. It's just that that's a little complicated. So for this, for the sake of this exercise, I'm going to just rely on, uh, on a library called Firefly from Andy Payne, who's also a good friend. And he has, this library is really good for Arduino, utilities, networking, and, and computer vision. And in the computer vision part, there are some components that allow you to convert between system bitmap and Firefly images, which is the which is the system which is the type that Firefly uses to render stuff. So I'm going to convert from system bitmap to a Firefly bitmap, so that then I can use the bitmap painter to just view that um, to just view that thumbnail. And if I now save the file, and if I were to recompute, probably this thumbnail now changes to what I'm seeing right now. Can you see? And if I zoom in and I recompute, okay, let me recompute. And if I recompute, oh no, I have to save the file. Yeah, let me do something. I'm going to save the file and then I'm going to recompute because the thumbnail gets generated for files when they get saved. And also we got two more elements here. So I think that's kind of cool. It's quite meta, right? <laughs> All right. Now, what is the next thing we're going to implement? Thing we're going to implement is the preview color. All right, and that's going to be R, and then it's going to be G, and then this is going to be B, and then this is going to take no output. And the input here is going to be an integer, an integer, and an integer, and edit five, and that's going to be for example. Okay, and then I'm just going to throw a cube here for the sake of visualization. Okay, so this one here. <clears throat> and I'm going to drop this here. And I can change colors here by saying, well, this is going to be, and for selected items, I can also change the color here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and we're going to do the same thing for preview color. And then it's going to be selected. Same thing. And then we're going to say this is going to be, I don't know. Is it going to be very blue? Blue color is going to be slightly blue. And then this is going to be super blue, for example. Something like that, I don't know. Okay. Next thing we're going to try is we're going to use Grasshopper components to change the actual pre-visualization color of the geometry that Grasshopper renders on, uh, on Rhino. Okay. That's going to be super easy and super cool. You know how the colors 
of the geometry that show in, in Rhino, the pre-visualization, is actually driven by this setting here. So you can see how the document preview settings for normal, I can make it blacker or more redder or whatever. And also for selected geometry, which is a different color, I can also click here and then just use a different color for selected geometry. So I'm going to do that programmatically. So I have dropped this random cube here that is currently being drawn with the default colors, which is red for all the geometry and green for the pre-selected one. What I would like to do is I would like to custom change that with some components, right? So how is that going to work? Well, first thing is I'm going to go into the component and this is the one that is going to change the color of the, um, of the normal pre-visualization. The way that works is that I can access the grasshopper document, all right? And then here, what I can do is for the preview color, you can see that I have the two options, preview color and preview color selected. For the preview color, I can choose a color to set it to. But how do I define color? So let us take a look at this. So preview color actually i think it's written in the british way preview color exactly the preview color property takes a color object and color is actually not a type that lives in it's not a type that lives in grasshopper or in rhino it's actually a type that is from the c sharp core libraries from system drawing in this case so what i would need to do is i would need to make sure that i am adding i'm first constructing an object with an object of an, a color object with the rgb values and then using that object to change the preview so how am i going to do that it looks like i can create colors from names but it also looks like I probably can create them from RGB colors. So for example, how do I do that? You can use this, the from RGB method to give it four integers or three integers and then create a color. So I'm going to do that. First of all, I'm going to load using system.drawing. And I know that because if I look at the color class, you can see that this, the namespace to which color belongs to is system drawing. So I need to have that available for me. Therefore, once I have that, I can create a variable of the type color and say, this is going to be color from RGB. And then I can give it one RGB, oops. I can give it one RGB, RGB or the alpha. So I'm just going to use here R, G and B. All right, and then I'm going to set this to be that variable that I just created. So I'm going to do that, and you can see that now the preview color all of a sudden just changed, and I can change it programmatically here, which is very cool. And it, but it turns out that this is not great because um, the original one has a level of transparency, correct? So let me just add another input here, a integer and I'm going to copy this. So this is going to be the level of alpha of that color and I'm going to add this here. All right. So alpha right now is at zero. So it means fully transparent and now it's a bit darker. How cool is this? Huh? We're hacking grasshopper from grasshopper. Okay. <laughs> All right. And I wonder if I remove this if the system color goes back to no, it's already what it, whatever it is, it's already changed by this by this component. All right. Anyway, what about here? So we're going to add the same thing. I'm just going to add the alpha, and then the type here is going to be integer. I'm just going to copy the same slider here, and then here we're going to do the exact same thing. We are going to say I'm going to import the system. Oops, I'm going to import the system.drawing library namespace. Then I'm going to define a variable of the type color 
is going to be equal to a new object that I'm going to create from A, R, G, and B parameters. And then in this case, the grasshopper document, I am going to change uh, the preview color for selected. And I'm going to set it to this color here. If I do that, it looks like this has changed. But what I need to do is I need to select the object. And once it is selected, you can see that the color is changing. So now, for example, this is the color for selected and this is the color for not. Not selected, selected. Not selected, selected. And you can see how also the settings have also changed, which is kind of cool. So you can see that we can change programmatically from within Grasshopper the preview colors by just working with the properties of the Grasshopper document. Okay. Awesome. What else? What else? What are we doing now? Okay, the next thing we're going to do is object selection. Mm -hmm. And for that, what are we going to do? I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to paste in the center here, heavy calculation. This is going to be okay. I don't need this. This is the integer. Where is this grasshopper profiler? I forget why I did that. Profiler. Get or sets the profiler mode used. Because processor time is being measured. Memory footprint is being measured. Okay. Processor time. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. Can't. I can't crank it up anymore. Is it is that as big as it can get? What? That is not great. Okay. Okay, so I'll just um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, heavy calculation, and then what's next? What I want to do, 
Um, mm -hmm. uh, paste in the center. Get a baby oh. All right, and then the threshold in millimeters names millis and UIDs. Okay, I'm going to remove all of this. Okay, and we're going to do this together. <clears throat> How is this going to look like? I'm going to get the names and the milliseconds that they take to execute and the UIDs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm, yeah. And actually, I'm going to disable this so that if someone opens the document, they don't get the the changes. <clears throat> okay. And this is going to be. All right, let's do this. Hmm. I believe the last thing that I would like to do for this video is to do a small exercise on component manipulation. The idea is that we have seen examples of how to look at the Rhino document, how to look at the Grasshopper document, but within the Grasshopper document, there's all these components that all have their own properties, their own code, etc., etc. So something that I would like to do is to do a couple of examples of how can we look at other components from our code and how can we manipulate them in order to change their state or change certain things about their the way they they work and they show up in inside of Grasshopper. Okay, so for example, I've made a really quick example here where I have a C sharp C -sharp script component that um, I've called heavy calculation, which is basically a for loop that goes over I don't know what it is this like a hundred million times. And then it performs a hundred million times just adding one unit to this to this variable. This variable is, a, is of the type long because hundred million is more than the capacity of a regular integer. And then it's outputting that value here to the console. So if I do that, then you see that I get this number here. All right. And um, so what are we going to do now? So the idea is that I would like to write a component that takes, <clears throat> excuse me, I would like to take a, a, I would like to get a component to write a component that given a threshold, you can see that I have my profiler turned on and my profiler is saying that this component took 260 milliseconds to execute. So what I would like to do is write a component, for example, that looks at the whole grasshopper definition, finds out which grass, which components are the heaviest, which ones are taking the longest to execute. Uh, for example, all the components that take more than 100 milliseconds or less, uh, or, or whatever I said the slider, and then to retrieve their names, how long it took them to execute, and their global unique identifier. And I will explain what that is and why that's important in a second. All right. So how are we going to do that? Well, um, it's actually not that difficult. It's just a little more lengthy than the other components. So I'm going to write the algorithm here, and then I will write the output somewhere. Uh, we're we'll losing, we're losing like uh, the the good customs and writing clean code. So first of all, 
the first thing that I would like to do is I will need to retrieve an instance of all the objects that live in my Grasshopper document so that then I can go each one over one by one, look at their execution time. And if it's over the threshold, then I cherry pick their names and their values. All right. So what is the first thing that I'm going to do? First of all, I'm going to write, I want to create empty lists for the names, the milliseconds and the IETs that I'm going to be creating, that I'm going to be outputting for this component. So I'm going to create a list of names and that's going to be a new list of a string objects. All right, that's going to be a new list of string objects. And then I'm going to create another list of integer, which is going to be the millis or the computation time. And then last, I'm going to create a list of GUIDs, which is an which is a specific class that represents a basically a random string of letters and numbers that can be used for identification purposes. And again, I will talk about this later in a second. So I have my empty lists. Okay. Then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to retrieve a copy of all the elements of all the components that are active in my grasshopper definition right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say all the components, I'm going to take them by pinging the grasshopper document and asking to get all the active documents that is going to be returned as a list. All right. And if I were to actually, I would have to type this so I could just use var and then get it over with. And this is probably going to work, although it's not working right now because names cannot be declared. Ah, oh, because I have, I have, um, I have, I'm choosing the same names as this very smart for myself. Uh, so I'm going to call component names, component mealies, and then component IDs. All right. So that was the problem, but this also works. However, I happen to like to type things so that I know exactly what I'm working with. And it turns out that the description of this, the autocomplete was not giving me the full fledged signature of the type of what I was being returned. So let's take a look then at the documentation. So active objects. So it looks like if the grasshopper document has the active objects method, that's great. And the return type is a list of I grasshopper active objects. All right. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste it here. And this is great because now I know that this list is not grasshopper components or whatever is basically this data type. And what that means is that if I need to now figure out what can I read for component objects, I know that this is the type and therefore I can just go to IG active objects and see that components now have attributes, exposure icons, whether if they're locked, whether if they're obsolete processor time. Oh, this sounds promising for what I want to do. Runtime message level. We've seen this before is for giving them tiny messages on top. Add to document, add runtime message. We've also seen this clear data expire solution. There's all the stuff that I can do on objects that live inside of the document. All right. So this is typically good practice, especially for tutorials. I like doing this so that we can all learn exactly what are we doing. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over each one of them and then try to figure out if these are the ones that I, if the component has the processing time of that component is over my threshold and then retrieve data for that. So for that, I'm going to use a for each component and then I'm going to retrieve all these uh, for each active object OBJ in components then, or maybe I'm going to do C in components. What I'm going to do is first of all, I'm going to see if the component, if it's processor time and the processor time is a complex object that has a lot of stuff. You can change things. You can get how many days it took, how many hours, etc. 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the property milliseconds of processor time. And if this is greater or equal than threshold, so that value that I set here, just for the time being to see if it works, I'm going to print here, found a heavy object. Just, just for testing, all right? I'm going to print to the console. I'm going to run this code. I'm going to plug a panel here. And you can see that I did find two heavy objects right now in my document. One of them is this one. The other one, I don't really know which one it is right now. I will need to look back. Okay, so that's working. So now what I want to do is from that object, I want to take its name, how many milliseconds it took, and its ID, and I want to store it in the list that is going to become the output. So what I want to do is I'm going to say to C names, I would like to add a property of this component. So C dot, and does it have a nickname? So the nickname is the one that you can overwrite here. The name is the one, the original name that is immutable in Grasshopper. So I'm going to get the nickname, for example, and I'm going to add it to the list. So is this working? It is working. Oh, but uh, I removed this and then I'm not outputting anything. So let me fix that. So names is going to be this list that I created called C names. Millis, the output is going to be this list that I created called C millis. And then GUIDs is going to be this C um, IDs list that I created. And if I run this now, you can see that I have two components that are pretty heavy duty. One is the heavy calculation one, the one that I had here, and another one is mesh remesh. Can we go back to the what we did previously? Can you see how mesh remesh is actually taking more than 100 milliseconds here? And the other ones are fine, are less than... So that's great. So this can be a really nice tool to give you a sense of some analytical, some analysis of what's going on in your definition. All right, and maybe like track down where things are too heavy, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe optimize, all right? How can we learn more? Well, let's take a look. So I did output this, the names. So to see me this, can I add C dot the processor time of that component in milliseconds. And if I run that, you can see that mesh remesh was 201 and heavy calculation is 260. All right, beautiful. And what about their IDs? So to see IDs, I'm going to add, I'm going to add C dot, um, uh, what was it? Instance GUID, all right? This is not to be confused with G with ID. All right, component G U I D because all the C sharp script components, they all have the same component ID. All right. However, each one of them, each one that I drop on a component, they have a different ins the different instance G E U I D. This is because Grasshopper likes IDs for the component to be the same across the same components so that the grasshopper can say, oh, all of these are C sharp script components. However, I know that they're different because each one of them has a different instance ID. Okay, that is basically like your social security number is the same for all of us. It's different for all of us, but um, our DNA is almost identical. That's not a great example. <laughs> okay, but you know where I'm, I'm getting I'm, I'm getting with this. So I'm going to use instance GUID. And I'm going to copy, and you can see that these are the IDs. Let me show you if I used component, uh, if I used component ID, what I would get is the same ID for both, which is the ID for any C sharp script component. All right, so I'm going to use then instead instance instance G U I D. All right. Beautiful. So with this, I have been able to track down components that are expensive that uh, and I'm to try to, to figure out some information about these components. But now say that I wanted to write something 
that changes those components and does something to those components. Um, how can I do that? Okay, the string and then <clears throat> okay, do I need an output for this? I don't really need an output for this, right? No. <clears throat> okay. So the last thing we're going to do for this video, the last example is going to be given, it's going to be manipulation of existing components. The idea is that I may want to write a component that given the IDs of a collection of components, what it does is it performs some kind of change in those components. There's many changes you can do, such as things such as, for example, turning the turning the pre-visualization on or off, locking the component or unlocking it, expiring the solution, etc. It just happens that expiring the solution is a little trickier because it, it also involves messing with the whole document itself. So I'm not going to do an example of that. But something that we can do is, for example, we can add a message. We can attach a message here to the bottom of the component uh, in a very simple way. So what I'm going to do is I have this Grasshopper component, this c -sharp script component that takes in an input here as a string. And that is also going to take the IDs of uh, components. So for example, I'm going to plug this in here and I'm going to make sure that I right click and that the type hint in this case is going to be this particular one that may have gone unnoticed to you until today, which is GUID. So I'm going to force the input to be an ID for a component. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in this component, I'm going to basically search any component that has this G, this global identifier, and then I'm going to make changes to that component. The first thing that I need to do then is I will need to find a component in my definition that has this GUID. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. So from my grasshopper component, sorry, in my grasshopper document, I can access, I can find, for example, I can find a component. And you can see that the options are the global ID or a system drawing point. I've actually never used this one, but I think you can find points, you can find components by location on the canvas, by nearby location. Uh, so I'm not even going to bother with that. So I'm, we're going to find the one that has this particular ID. All right, and as usual, I said the this is going to be the result of that. I could just use, for example, the implicit type operator bar, but I don't like that. So I'm going to make sure that I know what type that is returning. I could do that by looking at the return type and I can see that it's an IGH component type. So. In this case, I don't really need to look at the documentation. I'm just going to say IGH dot uh, component slash underscore component. And let's see if this is doing anything. So print dot nickname. Is that true? And you can see that uh, I am getting two 
nicknames, so mesh and, and remesh and heavy calculations. So it means that this component is positively, it's working and it's finding those components by ID in the document. So what I would like to do now is just simply change something. So for example, C dot, I believe there's a message option. And that message, if I, what I do is I overwrite it with whatever it's coming in from the component, then as I, you have heavy calculation here. So as I re-execute this, what you can see is that this message heavy duty was added to this component. And if I go to remeshing, probably, yes, we also have this message that got added here. I could, for example, do I have enough room here? I could just change this and say, uh, uh, expensive calculation. And if I do that, that gets changed, or I could just simply delete it and remove all the messages. This is not great practice because if you're if you're working with components that do their own message manipulation and the display information, etc., you're basically overriding that. So, um, word of caution there. Perhaps a nicer trick would have been to just create a group around that component and then put a tag on that component. But I think at this point. I'm a little tired and I've been doing this all morning. So I'm going to leave that exercise to you, the viewer, if you can create a component that basically finds a component by ID, wraps it inside of a group, and then puts a tag on top of that group. That's actually quite nice to do. Why not? All right. If you actually do that, make sure to share that uh, code with us here on the comments on the video or share it on Discord. And I would be more than happy to incorporate this code and give you credit in the sample files that we share with, um, with the rest of the community. Okay, beautiful. So that was the last example that I think I wanted to run with. We have seen how to read properties of the document, the Rhino document, the Grasshopper document. We have seen how to make changes on the properties of the grasshopper document, for example, the color that we use for pre-visualization. And we have seen techniques, and these are very useful, to identify, search, and filter certain components on a grasshopper definition, and also make changes to those components. And uh, everything with code programmatically in a very meta way, if you will. Now, speaking of meta, what I would like to recommend to you as well is that Everything that you have seen today is basically the building blocks of this amazing plugin that Andrew Human put together called Meta Hopper, which is all about finding things and modifying definitions and grouping things programmatically and creating components that allow you to search uh, for things in your Grasshopper document and change those things in your Grasshopper document. It's super powerful and you can see the document info also gives you the name of the document, the file path, the components as a list. It gives you a lot of information. It's, it's basically a much better version of what we just saw done today. But the code inside of the components is very similar to, it follows the same principles that we have seen here. All right. So if you want to learn more about that, go to Food for Rhino and search for Meta Hopper and you will be able to download it and install and use another one, another amazing component, another amazing plugin by um, very prolific and very active in the open source and free community uh, author, Andrew Human. I'm a big, very big fan of his work. So that was it for today. Document components. I hope this was useful for you to understand the skeleton and the how things work internally inside of Grasshopper and to get a better, larger picture of how everything is interconnected. If this was helpful for you, as usual, maybe you want to consider liking this video. Maybe you want to consider subscribing to the channel, saying a thank you word or whatever uh, sign of gratitude um, uh, you are more inclined to. And in the meantime, thanks for being here and I'll see you on the next videos in this series. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. All right. How was that? Those of you who survived the storm, it's been three hours already. 
Oh boy. That was a lot. Oh, and I'm very hungry. Woo. Oh, okay, so um, I think with this, I'm going to wrap it up. I have a lot of work to do this afternoon <laughs> and tomorrow and the rest of the week. So thanks a lot for being there, but blah, 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 for being dear and there. <laughs> I like that. Thank you for being there. <laughs> Thank you for being there and I will see you next week probably. It's Thanksgiving week here in the US, but um, I'm, I will be live streaming probably on Wednesday and maybe even later because I have some time off because of Thanksgiving. So thank you very much and see you around. Bye bye.